After Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, it took the early church some time to figure things out, but they did. The Spirit made herself acutely aware, acutely apparent at Pentecost, falling on them in ways that brought them up short and surprised them, but also enlivened and emboldened them. Saul's turn to Christ added to their energy and gave them some breathing room, since their most fierce persecutor was now one of them. That same Saul, renamed Paul, started preaching the gospel. Peter was healing people in Jesus' name. And there's this briefly told story in chapter 8 about Philip meeting an Ethiopian eunuch. Weird, they probably all thought, but they had found their groove, bringing the good news to the children of Israel. They knew what they were about, and they had a clear sense of purpose. I imagine they were just about comfortable in their roles. But then Peter has this vision, and their world gets rocked. It's a little hard for us to understand the extent of what Peter did in obeying his vision and allowing that knock upon the door to lead him someplace new. The criticism that he faces and the questions the apostles and believers ask when he goes to Jerusalem give some indication of the momentous nature of what happened. The apostles and believers are geared up for a fight when they finally get to be face to face with Peter and confront him about what he's done. What were you doing is the really nice way to ask what they ask. In the Greek, it actually sounds more like an accusation than a question. You did this. You went to uncircumcised men, with the undertone being, how could you? At that time, even those following Christ thought of themselves as Jewish, and they were a people set apart until the Spirit told Peter otherwise. It's no wonder they were upset. They wanted to be faithful. They thought they had it figured out. They wanted to do what God wanted them to do. And most people appreciate feeling like they know what to do, appreciate feeling comfortable, even in our walks of faith. After I had been with you all for about a month, Tom said to me, besides the people at Middle Spring, what do you miss the most? And I immediately answered, feeling comfortable and like I know what I'm supposed to be doing every day. And if you have ever thought to yourself something like, you know, the world is changing so much and so fast, I just want my church to stay the same, then perhaps you can understand how those believers felt when they were faced with Peter's vision. Because now they're hearing from Peter that he's heard from the Spirit and that they've all got a new calling to be open to people they never considered could be a part of God's covenant, to be open to people they had somewhat actively avoided. Peter's openness to the movement of the Spirit set the church in a new direction, a less comfortable direction. But that's the way the Spirit works, and often just when we think we have it all figured out. Seeking to discern the movement of the Spirit in our common life is a part of our task as Christian. Discernment is the work of listening to the Spirit. Remember our motto, reformed and always being reformed according to the word of God and the call of the Spirit. Instead of asking, what do we want to do? We ask, what does God wish for us to do? What's God's desire for us? What is God doing and how can we join in? And in asking those questions, we assume that God wants to make God's desires known to us and will do so. Now, there are things to note about this moment with Peter and the life of the church that are instructive for our own discernment. First, it wasn't just Peter's moment. 
It seems to be all about him, but it's not. Peter's telling the story for the second time. The first telling is in chapter 10, and it's only one part of the story. We shouldn't forget about Cornelius, the Gentile to whom the Spirit sent Peter. He's an outsider who also has a revelation of the Spirit for the church, telling him to send to Joppa and for Peter to come to him. With Cornelius' vision from the Spirit, without Cornelius' vision from the Spirit, Peter wouldn't have had a direction in which to take what he's given. Each of them, insider and outsider, have a portion of the direction from the Spirit and each confirms what the other is hearing. Also, Cornelius sends three people to go get Peter, and Peter takes with him six other people to go meet Cornelius. Could that have been the first committee? Maybe. Certainly, all of those people must have had questions and thoughts of their own. And I imagine the walk to Caesarea was bubbling over with that kind of conversation. And I imagine that Peter showed great humility in listening to his colleagues, because listening takes humility, and so does discernment. It takes humility to listen to each other, honoring the contributions of each in the process, seeking to listen for God's truth in what everyone is saying, even when we might not agree 100%. In his classic book on community, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, the first service one owes to others in a community involves listening to them. We do God's work for our brothers and sisters when we learn that. So often Christians, especially preachers, he says, think that their only service is always to have to offer something when they are together with other people. They forget that listening can be a greater service. Christians who can no longer listen to one another will soon no longer be listening to God. But that walk that Peter and the disciples have to Caesarea isn't the only time the new mission to the Gentiles will be debated. We have this second accounting of Peter faced with apostles and believers who are pretty ticked off, and they are not trying to hide it. But he doesn't come in demanding that they listen or insisting that he's right. He doesn't get aggrieved or offended when they ask questions and even make some accusations. Instead, he patiently takes them through it step by step. And those gathered contemplate what Peter says in silence and I imagine in prayer. And I don't think it unfolded as quickly as it did in the text from one sentence to another. I imagine that they talked as they came to the conclusion that Peter's understanding of the Spirit was a new direction for them all. But with new direction from the Spirit, not everyone comes along immediately, and the conversation goes even further. So patience is needed for discernment. Even as Peter and then Barnabas and Paul continue to reach out to Gentiles, there are others who insist that, okay, maybe the Gentiles can be part of the covenant with God, but they have to go through circumcision first. So they really have to become Jewish first. And so then there's another council held in Jerusalem, and they debate again, and they pray, and they reflect on scripture and tradition and their experiences together. And they do decide that Paul and Peter are hearing correctly and the Gentiles turning to God should not be troubled with circumcision, probably to the relief of many. <sighs> Listening to God in prayer and to one another in conversation, reflecting on scripture and tradition and experience, humility, patience, these are the foundations of discernment. But we shouldn't think about it too narrowly. It's not just a technique for making decisions that we pull out at session meetings. Former moderator of our General Assembly, Joan Gray, says, discernment is a way of orienting ourselves toward God as the true north in our lives. It develops in us a Christian character. 
The goal of discernment is that little by little, we come to embody the gospel and become obedient partners in God's work in the world. And we have to admit that the church hasn't always been good at discerning the work of the Spirit, nor have we always become partners in that work. Long ago, many predominantly white denominations, including ours, came late, if ever, to join efforts to abolish slavery. Many predominantly white churches could not support the civil rights movement until it was clear that things were going to change with or without the white church. Many denominations, including ours, came late to supporting equal rights for LGBTQ siblings. And so how else are we missing the ways God seeks to shape and lead us? It was just that kind of question that Peter was asking on that roof in Joppa. And this is the kind of question that we are now asking here at Market Square, as the session calls for us to enter into an intentional process of discernment with our ministry assessment project. And if you haven't read about that yet, it's in this month's newsletter and last month's newsletter. The project isn't about what we think the church should be doing, any of us, but it's about all of us listening for what God thinks we should be doing. And each of you will have an opportunity to be a part of that discussion. And I hope you will, because every voice is needed. And I hope you'll enter the discussion with humility, with prayer, through listening, and with patience. Friends, the Spirit is still speaking, and each of us is capable of discerning God's Spirit together. Some will do so with visions as sharp as Peter's, some with a quieter but steadily growing understanding gained through prayer, some through conversations with others. As many as we are are the ways the Spirit chooses to be in relationship with us. We may go through the process too slowly for some or too quick for others. We may not arrive at answers with which everyone agrees, but I do hope that we arrive somewhere together. For the Spirit is a spirit of unity, not division. The Spirit of God is the real hero in today's story. The Spirit of God who nudges, challenges, comforts, unites us. The Spirit of our gracious and prodding God who makes bold promises and keeps them. Who finds a way to lead us even in the midst of human distinctions and partiality and strong personalities. So let us listen to her. Let us be fully alive in her. And let us be born boldly on her breath. Amen.